I'd like to <coughs> introduce Peter Thorne to begin our annual world update where we hear from industry analysts who are studying what has been going on in our industry and to give a picture of some of their data that they have just to give a, uh, an annual taste. With that, Peter. The, the applause is for Peter, not for me. That was a good talk. When Brad trailed this session to me, he said, now what we really want is the facts. And so I thought, now this year is a really rather special time, you know, because for since the 1500s, you know, that was when, when the fact, what was a fact, kind of changed, wasn't it? Until about 1500, it really was just folklore and what important people believed. Those were true facts. And then there was the Enlightenment, and then and we've been through this, this you know, significant time since about 1500, maybe 1600, um, when facts turn, you know, were driven by science, by engineering. You needed to have some evidence as to, to make up what was an actual fact. And then more recently, you know, we've been through this kind of political change where we need to talk about alternative facts. And there was a, a British politician during the Brexit campaign that made some reference to what the world thought about the opinions of experts, which I have to say was not hugely complimentary. And, you know, that side of the um, argument in Britain won the day when it, when it came to the vote. So I thought, okay, I ought to be, you know, quite careful about what I describe as, you know, Cambash's facts. So our facts about the past are indeed you know, what we put together from what everyone out there publishes. So comp what companies publish, um, what executives of industries uh, uh, report, sometimes through journalists, um, and if they're responsible uh, uh, journalists and executives, we'll incorporate those into our models. Our facts about the future are just like everyone else's facts about the future. They are our estimates. And what I can tell you about them is we do them in a very systematic way. So when I, I asked the, the team to start counting sources, and as we hit about 500 different sources, I said, have we got halfway yet, you know, to the number of sources that we use? And the answer was no, you know, we, we've just scratched the surface. We use a lot of sources, we put them together in a, uh, a systematic way. So. Sometimes it's not easy to produce numbers which reflect the facts. So in 2015, you know, it was a time of currency changes. There were these dramatic changes. And that meant that the kind of yardstick that was being used around the world, this yardstick was going up and down like this. You know, how do you measure the facts when, when, when that's going on? In 2016, it was difficult because uh, one company, Autodesk in particular, made a very deliberate change in the way that they would earn revenues. It was going to be through subscriptions, not through the sale of uh, perpetual licenses anymore. And that in itself made a difference um, to the world market in terms of revenues. Um, and as it turned out, a lot of other players started reporting higher than expected interest in subscriptions. And being um, from the analyst community, of course, the analysts all look at that and say, well, it's a really good way of reporting results that are a little bit below expectations, isn't it? If you say, ah, yes, there was so much interest in, in subscriptions, that that meant we, only, we got less money because people were only paying for this year, not for the perpetual uh, license. So we're going to have to watch that, see how it plays out. Um, 2017, what are those changes, are those sort of confusion factors going to be? Don't really know yet. We shall find out. So let's start by looking back rather than forward. These are not Kambashi numbers. Here I'm showing you United Nations data available through the OECD. And what this is, is regional distribution of world GDP. So those uh, red dots are Europe, uh, and the green line is Asia. Green has been going up. No surprises there. Um, if we look at Europe, 
Well, I've perhaps been a bit cruel in the way that I've drawn that, uh, that arrow, but overall, uh, the share of world GDP in Europe has been going down. Um, if we draw the same for North America, well, you could draw that horizontal. It's obviously gone up and down a little bit, but it's not far off uh, uh, horizontal. And then if we look at the other regions, um, that gray arrow is Latin America and the Caribbean. Hard to describe the shape of that, but I thought this was the useful thing to look at. You know, it was round about 5% through the 70s, and then over the last several years has been round about 7%, which is interesting. And if we look at uh, uh, Africa, that black dotted line, 1980 to 2003, I suppose, was nudging down. You can kind of see that. Then it was sort of flat. And then since 2004, it's actually been nudging up um, a little bit. Now, UN data only goes up to 2015, uh, and, and that's the disadvantage of using this, this, you know, the national and the international stuff. It means you get 40,000 field workers working for you, gathering the data. That's good. They do it all, and they write the reports, and they present the results in the way that, that you can use. The trouble is, they can only be about 18 months, two years, sometimes three years um, uh, uh, behind, behind the times. So let's, um, having been a bit cruel to Europe, let's look at the numbers in a different way, just to you know, get, a, get another view of this same set of data. So this is now in constant currency, according to the UN, and they have used $2,005 and looked at the world GDP by region. So if we look at the top three, you think, oh, well, that looks much less sort of bad for, for Europe. Instead of just that nasty downsloping arrow, it looks much more like a, okay, having started in first place in 1970, slipped into second, but hey, you know, what's that? Still in the, in the leading pack, can't be too bad. Um, you know, and the US has shown quite steady progression. Then Asia does seem to have shown a bit of an uptick since um, uh, uh, 2000. So the thing is with that chart, there's quite a lot that, that, that's hidden. Um, if you look at 1970, the gap from first to third was four and a half trillion, which, you know, big number. Key is, it was 25% of the total. And if you look now, the gap is, has, is less, and you can see that on the chart, it's down to two trillion. But it's of a much larger total. So it's actually only 4% of a larger total. So what we're seeing is three regions with, with much more equal contribution um, to, to the world uh, e economy. Um, so are they three equivalent regions? No, obviously, they are dramatically different. And the parameter that I chose to sort of point this out is population. So if you look at North America and um, you, you, the, the UN definitions here, the population, the total population of the region is 360 million. Um, if you look at Europe, the total population is 740 million. And then, of course, Asia. And Asia is rather different. If you add Europe and North America together and then multiply by four, you just about get the population of Asia. So if you're trying to use those charts and make a forecast into the future to look at what is going to happen over 10 or 20 years, of course we don't know. But it's certainly true that Asia has got the population that is capable of keeping that green line going up. But it's not only you know, the totals, but it's what sort of economic activity is going on. Um, and this is where I look through the tables that the UN used to create those, those charts um, and classified by um, services and industry. So this is a really simple classification. Uh, there's, there's only services, industry, and agriculture. Okay, and agriculture, you know, well done agriculture for feeding us all, and yet, you know, their GDP just burbles along close to the 0% uh, uh, line because none of us now buy, you know, sacks of flour and stuff, do we? 
we want it delivered on the back of a delivery bicycle, you know, that's been uh, cooked uh, in a restaurant. And the restaurant don't even cook it themselves. They buy it from a manufacturer who's packaged it all. So there's a huge amount of services in that, um, uh, you know, what actually ends up, what, what starts a, a result of uh, agriculture. Um, but I think a lot of us have the perception that there's this continuing trend to services. And in fact, that's true in the developed economies. But when you add it up to a world level, the last 15 years have been pretty level between services and industry. They have been a fairly constant share uh, of GDP. And the reason for that, of course, is fairly clear. It's that the emerging economies tend to have based their success and their growth on industry rather than services. So as they has become larger proportions of the economy, then that industry line has stabilized and that services line has stabilized. And it's only you know, the developed economies where we all get to this point where we can't actually consume any more stuff. It's just, you know, litters the place up that we demand services. You know, we want that meal delivered. We want it packaged. We want somebody to not only, you know, cut our hair, but also give us a massage and advise us on you know, what we should be wearing next week or, or something. Not me. As you can tell, I don't take, I, I have no interest in, in that type of service. Well, perhaps the haircut anyway, but. Okay. Um, so that's the services continuing to grow in, in the developed uh, economies, despite that stabilization at the global level. So that's the stratospheric view. Now let's dive into engineering software. Um, and this is where what we're talking about is end user expenditure on Kambash's scope of engineering software measured in constant 2013 dollars. Um, so what is that scope? Well, here you can see the components that I'm going to talk about. I call it PLM because it is the very broad view of PLM. It's not just product lifecycle management, the kind of version control stuff. I'm using that word to, to include all the authoring tools and indeed a good subset of simulation um, uh, tools. BIM, building information management, the uh, same thing applies. Uh, our BIM is mainly the design stuff, not so much from the uh, construction or the operations uh, phase. Uh, GIS and visualization, the GIS is just anything that is geospatial. Um, and the visualization includes the media and entertainment parts of uh, visualization. Cs is <laughs> a absolute, a title that rattles off the tongue. Systems, engineering, and embedded software development tools. So this is the part of the market as products have become smarter, engineers to, to develop products have had to build the software to go inside them. And it's that set of software tools that are in, in included in there. EDA is on there for completeness. Uh, these blue blocks do not include EDA because we, I'll just in, use the um, EDA uh, numbers from the, um, uh, the EDAC consortium that um, changed its name recently and I can't think of its new name. So apologies to them. Hopefully I will remember before the end of the uh, session. So that's the total, and it looks good. Growing up to you know, something like $32 billion of end user expenditure, that's on software licenses, it's on reseller margins, because that's you, you know, the amount the end users uh, uh, spend, and it includes services provided by um, those software vendors. But it excludes all of the third party services. So the big service providers, the Accentures, the um, uh, Tata, the, uh, you, you know, these types of company, those service providers doing big projects in this space, their revenues are not included here. Um, so let's try and break that, uh, well, first of all, let's look at the growth curve. A um, little bit jagged, really, and there's a reason for that. I mentioned it earlier, currencies in 2015, um, subscriptions uh, in 20. 16. But let's try and look uh, forward a bit. 2017, 7.2%. That is a healthy market. This industry is doing well. 
in a situation where in the world people are struggling to achieve national level growth across the whole of an economy of 2%. 7% is good growth. People want this stuff, they're buying this stuff, they're investing uh, in, in this stuff. And which, um, as I said, there's this, this interest in subscriptions, which I, I must admit I'm slightly surprised by, given the total cost of ownership calculations, if you, if you do those in relation to um, subscriptions. But there is demand. Um, CFOs, financial directors, forever. If it's a time of uncertainty, they wanted to change fixed costs into variable costs. And one of the ways they can do that is by changing things from capex into opex. And subscriptions um, fit that bill. Um, there's obviously the sales side of the budget authority. It's a lower initial cost. Maybe that can get sign off sooner. Um, there are a good number of industries that can pass the costs through to the client if, more easily if it's shown as an operational e expenditure. And there's also this factor of the cloud. Subscriptions, pay as you go, pay per usage is actually expected because of the way the cloud works. Um, and in our research, we're finding that in users of software, Almost more importantly, we're finding it in the sales forces of vendors. The sales teams are saying, we want um, usage-based uh, uh, licensing, please. So there are marketing groups who are trying to figure out how on earth to, de to, to deliver that. So subscription, whatever you think about it, looks as if it's a trend that is here to stay and probably here uh, uh, to grow. So let's look at the components of that market. So the color codes there just match the various, you know, PLM, at the orange at the bottom, then BIM, the yellow next up, then the geospatial and visualization, and then the um, software systems engineering and the software development tools. And I'll clutter the chart up by showing a growth curve for each of those. And I don't know, there's a number of things to say. Um, Probably for C's, you know, it's obviously the highest growth. It, um, being caught in 2018, we think, by BIM, possibly that's because of the um, strength of the subscriptions effect in BIM, and that's the subscriptions effect playing out for, for 2018. Um, if we look at, uh, uh, yeah, the Autodesk move had a, had a big uh, effect on that, of course, uh, but Autodesk are not the only vendor uh, involved in subscriptions by any means. If I add back in the total growth curve, then the way you can look at it is that the components, PLM, BIM, Geospatial, are in that 4 to 7% range. Cs is up in double figures, and that comes to 7.2%. And when we look forward, we get to 10.6% uh, for 2018. If add in EDA, then the result looks like a pretty healthy market. $33 billion worth of um, software, uh, of end user expenditure on software licensing um, and growth near and at double figures over the, over the next uh, few years. And, um, you know, there's stuff that we don't include. I realize that in our PLM set, uh, you, you know, there's some CAE, but we've done new CAE research working with Joe at, at uh, Intrinsim, and we've now got a, a rather broader scope of um, CAE research, 470 simulation uh, firms outside of the EDA space. In 2017, they're going to be growing revenues by 8.6%, and actually there's a hot spot in that research in applications in plastics that are showing you know, growth significantly more than that 8.6%. Uh, uh, okay, where's the opportunity? This is looking at those three of the software types, so just BIM, PLM, and the geospatial, for 64 countries, 11 uh, industries. So I think there are 2,500 dots on, on that chart. Um, but I, I, you know, it's just a bit of a blur. But I've, I've used it because it's rare to see a sector that is quite such an outlier as, as that one. You know, a country industry in PLM that appears to be dropping by 35%, and the scale on the left 
is actually a constant currency growth over five years from 2016. Any suggestions? Anyone like to tell me what that sector is? Which country, which sector? You'll kick yourselves. You'll remember it. It's automotive in Australia. And why do I say you'll remember it? Because there were those announcements in 2013. Ford said they were going to cease manufacturing. GM said they were going to uh, shut down manufacturing by 2017. And that's in progress. But there's a great example of how it's, you know, forecast is subject to what actually happens in the world and real events. So just in the last two months, the Australian regions affected by these shutdowns have been bringing forward, they've been trying to tempt in, you know, the, the automotive manufacturers to come and take what are going to be empty facilities just right for automotive manufacturing. So, I don't know, you see all sorts of stuff in the Adelaide Gazette about what will turn up to uh, fill the... Um, uh, I've forgotten if that's Ford or, or Holden, which was the GM subsidiary in Australia. You know, the, the, the factory there. Um, they're hoping for Tesla. I don't think they're going to get that somehow, but you, you never know. You never know. So, yeah, Australian manufacturing, but subject to events. Please don't hold me to that outlier uh, 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 position. So, what else have we got there? Well, the only country that's got stuff below zero uh, uh, in this chart uh, is Venezuela. So, in, even BIM, which is, uh, you know, strong growth uh, generally, um, is showing uh, a decline over five years in, in Venezuela. Um, but I guess it's the stuff up at the top end that most people are more interested in. So let's zoom in on that little box up there. Um, and I, I think no real surprises, actually. You know, the AEC sector obviously is the major consumer of BIM software. Um, USA, Germany, and Japan are the top three countries there. Um, if we look down here in PLM, the orange uh, uh, circles, Japan Automotive, USA Aerospace and Defense. Um, uh, the one that may come as a surprise to, to folks is um, this geospatial, and it's USA public sector. Uh, so, you know, again, you've got to say this is the kind of forecast that is going to be subject to events. There have been changes in the USA, there have been statements made about how much public sector spend there's going to be. A good number of these organizations that have been spending a lot of money on mapping and producing some beautiful data sets for the, for the world to use, actually. Um, who knows whether that will, will uh, uh, continue. But that is the state uh, right now. So let's drill down some more. And sorry you can't read the text of these, but I will call out the ones that are interesting. This is a chart of 112 industries across the top, 64 countries down the side, with the industries ordered left to right a smallest to largest industry by global spend on engineering software. Same for the countries, smallest at the bottom, which is, I don't know, Lithuania or something, and largest at the top. The, the top three are USA, Germany, uh, and, and uh, uh, Japan. Um, this chart, I mean, you can do all sorts of slices on this data, of course. Um, and I should say that the full set of data is not just this aggregation of the total spend. Um, it, it can be sliced by 64 products of the leading products going into this in, in 3D, if you actually want to look at that level of detail. But this is looking at the total, and it's picking the negative compound growth rate over five years. So these are the potholes, areas to avoid. If you can see a horizontal line, it's a country. And no surprises there, that's Venezuela. Um, if you can see a vertical line, that's a kind of warning about that particular industry sector. And I don't know about you, but to me, there are three sort of fairly clear vertical lines there. And perhaps there's a surprise in what those sectors are. Programming, computer consultancy, and uh, manufacturing of, of peripherals. These have never been great sectors. If you look at what we're measuring here, which is BIM plus PLM plus 
uh, the geospatial stuff. If I'd included the seas data as well, the um, systems engineering, then I, th I think these sectors may have escaped this particular fate of being in negative uh, growth uh, area. Um, but you, you know, if you just take those sectors, if those are your sectors of interest, those are, um, if you take those applications rather, then those are sectors to, to just have another look at your plans to address those sectors. And then the other ones that uh, perhaps, are, well, I've already mentioned um, Australia, that's both automotive vehicles and um, parts. And perhaps those are interesting, uh, you know, ship and boat building in Australia and Malaysia. And if you think about the way that China has been building um, shipbuilding yards all around the coast uh, of China, if you think of the way that South Korea has been competing for that shipbuilding business, perhaps it's no surprise that you know, it looks as if uh, Australia and Malaysia may have problems you know, maintaining business uh, uh, in that sector. Uh, I mean, they may maintain it. You know, this is only saying negative CAGR. They may be able to stay where they are, not going to be growing sectors. So let me finish off by trying to talk about where the growth is. Now, this chart is um, looking at each of the columns here is looking at the period from 2017 to 2021. And it's a line chart with each of those years drawn in the column um, for each of those uh, regions. And I used it just really to say, well, okay, is it true about APAC, the, the kind of growth we saw of that green line of the total activity? APAC here is the yellow line. And yeah, maybe it is true. If you look at a majority of those sectors, then the yellow line is the, the largest um, uh, uh, growth area. So let's look at APAC a bit. And I just wanted to pick three countries, as uh, I hope countries of interest, China, South Korea, and India. India, I think, is really interesting. For years and years and years, India has been the one just about to take off just about to take off. It's all going to happen in India. And yes, it has happened. I mean, what did they get? 7% growth in their economy last year? Not bad. You know, that's matching China, maybe, maybe even a shade ahead of China. You know, it depends what you think you believe out of the figures that, that come out of uh, China. Um, in terms of the scale, I should say that 400 million at the top there um, those large sectors that we were looking at earlier from the top right of the chart, the one that we zoomed in on, they were all more than 400 million. So, you know, we're not talking about these um, three countries sort of getting up to that level, even in this forecast out to, to uh, 2021. Now, on this chart, India looks, you know, not, which is the software revenue chart. India doesn't look that exciting. But if we go on to the next view, which is looking at the growth from 2017 to 2021, then suddenly India looks more interesting. There is India's the yellow line still, and it is top in terms of growth, including some pretty strong growth, even by Asian standards um, across most of those uh, sectors. So yeah, I mean, if there's a message looking at this broad category of engineering software, um, the one to watch uh, is Asia, and within Asia, it's India as the opportunity of growth. Why is growth so interesting? It's because that's where the market produces white spaces, where your sales reps can go in and find new opportunities where there are no incumbents. Um, without growth, you're always going to be competing. With no growth, you've got to train your sales team to manage, you, you, to look for account control and run your marketing programs to play a kind of more defensive strategy to make sure you maintain share of uh, uh, wallet. So, you know, these things do have quite an effect on the way uh, you have to develop your, your business. That's on the numbers. There's a qualitative point that I think is very important, and, and that is the potential. And this has been up the hype cycle for a couple of years. It's been in vendor presentations for, for um, several years now. It's the Internet of Things. 
But what I think is interesting is the chance that this has to change the way that engineering data flows work. And when data flows work, the tool, when, when data flows change, the tools have to change to support those new workflows. And I think this has the potential to be a very, uh, to, to make some very big changes. So if we take this standard view, you know, development, production, uh, and in-service um, support, I think we've all heard about what can be done with um, uh, sensors in products. You can draw a chart, you know, here's, here's one of how in-service products, how the data can feed back to development. And, you know, there's some really easy things to say, like if you run simulations in development, you are definitely going to want that sensor feedback to be used to calibrate your simulations. So simulation vendors who can already absorb that kind of feedback and make calibrations, you know, they're going to do well. But, you know, you can say more than that. You say, well, hold on a moment. Google managed to, to solve translation, you know, without doing all that nonsense about semantics and so on. They just did it statistically. You know, if there's this set of words on one page, then statistically it ought to be this set of words in the translation. Is that ever going to be true about simulation and analysis, that actually there'll be so much feedback about products in the field that you've just got to select the example that matches the one you're trying to simulate? Don't bother with all this calculation and this tough science. I mean, finite elements? Oh, no, crikey, I've got a, a 50 petabyte uh, data set which tells me what everything of this topology has ever done in the real world. I'll just find the one that matches the best. Okay, I don't, you know, I, I don't really believe that, but it, it's the sort of change that we've got to be ready for in uh, 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 this, this area. So, that's it. I did want to say we are doing um, an Internet of Things report trying to understand the revenue flows through the market. If you want to see that report, it'll be free from us in May. Uh, send me an email. There's my email, and I'll make sure you're on the list uh, to, to get that report. And that really is it. Thank you.